My guest today is Dr. Ben House, a PhD in nutritional sciences from the University of Texas at Austin, which is one of the top-ranked universities in the United States. Dr. House is also a nutritionist, functional diagnostic nutritionist, and certified functional medicine practitioner. Dr. House was accepted to medical school without an undergraduate degree, but rescinded during this time his father was fighting for his life with a debilitating diverticulitis. The conventional medical model prescribed him painkillers, antibiotics, saltine crackers, and white bread. This pushed House to question the sick care model and look for the underlying lifestyle and dietary factors that could be the reason why his father was in so much pain. Lo and behold, his father had celiac disease, and within a week of removing all grains and dairy from his diet, he was symptom-free. This was Dr. House's first taste of functional medicine, and he knew at that moment that this would be his life's passion. Since then, he was studied under some of the best in the world and continues to regularly attend and present at conferences and seminars around the world. As a strength coach, Dr. House has worked at both the high school and collegiate levels, including time under Coach Wright at University of Texas Basketball. Besides practicing functional medicine, coaching, and writing articles for Functional Medicine Costa Rica, Dr. House has numerous publications in peer-reviewed, high-impact scientific journals. Dr. House blends his knowledge of research in functional medicine with years of experience working directly with a variety of different clients. Ben, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Yeah, that was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, but how are things going? Uh, it's really solid. Really, It's been a good Friday. How about you? Fantastic. Yeah, we're uh, you're a little bit warmer than we are uh, up here in Toronto, but you know we we got sunshine, so we're do we're doing all right. Yeah, it's a little hot here. It's, it's uh, I'm in the valley, so I I maybe trade places with you for like an hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Well, listen, it's great to have you on today, and I wanted to dive into all things uh, testosterone and sort of this low testosterone epidemic that I see all the time in my primary care clinical practice, and even in athletes, and even in female. Um, clients as well. So before we, to, to get everyone on the same page here, could you give us a little bit of info um, on the background of, you know, what does testosterone do for us besides, uh, you know, muscles and libido, which everyone thinks about, but can you give us a bit of the background and then we can dive into this topic? Man, yeah. So testosterone is, it's, we really, I think we got, we got a bad, we got a bad rap because we, we attach testosterone to like kind of Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire. And so we all have these, this negative connotation and, but testosterone is, is what, it's what makes us men, right? It feeds our frontal lobes. Um, and it drives a lot of the behaviors that we do have as men that are kind of honestly like looked down upon in, in our, in our current society. Um, and so that testosterone is obviously it's, it's anabolic towards muscle tissue. It's going to drive IGF. There's a lot of, a lot of things in males. We need it, right? It, if you don't have testosterone, you're going to have, you're going to have mood symptoms. You're going to not, you're going to not, you're going to be sore. You're not gonna be able to put on muscle mass. Um, and that's from a, like a hypogonadal standpoint, but from, from just a testosterone perspective, we need it. We have to have it. Yeah. I mean, we definitely see even in, you know, in clinical practice here, like cardiovascular health, mental health, bone health, all these kind of things that we don't, you know, oftentimes are secondary on people's lists, but, uh, it's definitely still, uh, really impactful. Now, can you kind of describe to me, like, what do you see in, in your practice with your clients and your athletes? Like, why are we, even in general from the 30,000 foot view, why do men have, why are we seeing so much low testosterone these days? Well, I think from the cross-sectional research, we see there's, like, if you have low testosterone, you're going to have a 40% more risk of all-cause mortality, your risk of obesity, depression, all, all this kind of bad stuff goes up. And I think we see that in the general population too. So it's kind of like, is testosterone just a canary for all these other bad habits and kind of bad things that are happening to males? And what I see mostly is is just kind of all over the board, right? So I see guys who have testosterone, they have, their testosterone maybe like their total T is like 400, but they feel fine and they're they're jacked out of their mind. And then I've seen guys who are at 800, their sex hormone binding globulins to the roof and and they have all the symptoms of kind of low testosterone. So you really have to do a deep dive in the lab work. And then the lab work is, is just a mirror, right? And so and you can argue whether serum levels are the best levels. It's just giving you a look at production. Um, and I think we need to have that caveat so we don't run into the, you know, the total testosterone being kind of the new bench press number. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's a great point. And, you know, if we start from – a frame of reference of just our, you know your average client comes in a guy might be 20 30 pounds overweight he's got uh, abdominal um, 
adiposity, so b- beer belly, belly fat, visceral fat. Um, can you walk us through uh, from a you know a cellular level? We know that insulin plays a role here, but but so does the systemic inflammation. So can you can you walk us through that and how that's impacting testosterone function? So when we have a guy who has all the things that you're talking about, like there's so many loops going on there, right? So maybe he's not sleeping and that's inducing kind of insulin dysregulation. And we know insulin is going to have a stimulatory effect on aromatase. Um, we know he could just be an energy overload state. And so his mitochondria are just, they're just saying no to energy. Right. And, and so there's so many wheels that men are coming into into clinics with, right? And we have micronutrient deficiencies, which can be all related to testosterone, low testosterone. So I think when we when we look at someone, we really have to kind of identify what loops are in play. Um, is there a stress loop? Is there a sleep loop? Is there a food loop? Is there um, some kind of thyroid loop? Because we know you need thyroid for the testosterone, for te- the testicles, for the Leydig cells to even uptake cholesterol to make testosterone. Um, we have to have mitochondrial health because the, that's where we make testosterone. And so the key regulatory step in steroidogenesis is it's called a star protein and it's what moves cholesterol into the mitochondria. And so there's, there's so many places that we have to look and it's, 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 I wish it was more simple and, and it's complex, but there's a simple side of complexity. But if we lose that, um, if we lose the complexity, I think we're, we're doing a disservice to people. And in terms of if we, if we, touch on that mitochondrial area to, to sort of start with. I mean, most of the time when we see people who are overweight, you know, we see lower levels of, well, increased levels of mitochondrial dif- dysfunction or, or, or not as great a numbers of healthy functioning mitochondria. So, um, you know, what's happening there in terms of, is, is the inflammation going to be driving down the mitochondrial function for, the, for that group? Is that one of the root causes for them? Yeah, I think it can definitely be like TNI, TNFL, IL-6, all those inflammatory cytokines, which are also going to impact the brain, right? They're going to make us more limbic. They're going <laughs> to – that's what they do. Um, from a from a mitochondrial dysfunction standpoint, I always think of three things, foods, bugs, and environmental toxins, right? And so those are, all, those are what's going to cause inflammation in the body. Inflammation is just a response by our own immune system. And so if we really want to think about mitochondrial health – we probably have to talk about fasting because that's going to recoup mitochondria and starts in about four hours. Um, we wa- we have to talk about exercise because that's going to stimulate the right amount of exercise and that's going to stimulate mitochondrial function. Um, and then we got to talk about toxins and all the stuff that can jack up mitochondria. And so, and why are mitochondria so important to testosterone? Um, there's, there's a really good paper that I can, that can send you a link to that you can link out to. It's by Camacho yeah. and I might be, I might be murdering his name. And, uh, he, <laughs> it's, uh, it came out in 2013 and it's basically questioning this idea of this age related decline in testosterone. And this could just be what we're seeing is increased aging or we're aging faster and our mitochondria are just getting, they're getting screwed up because of our current lifestyle and, and habits. Yeah, I think that's a pretty common one that gets hammered home with uh, in conventional medicine in terms of this idea of having to snack constantly throughout the day. And obviously in athletic populations and populations that are fit and lean, um, you know, meal frequency that's more frequent, five or six meals can be highly beneficial. But in terms of the average population, I mean, guys who are nibbling on snacks throughout the day, just keeping the blood sugar insulin levels up and, and, and you know, preventing this uh, – you know, periods of fasting, like you mentioned, that autophagy. So is that something that you use a little bit with your clients or? I think you got to get people ready to fast, right? Um, a lot of, a lot of people, if you're stressed out, you're going to pull yourself out of that anyways. Um, and you're going to go to glucose metabolism. So for me, it's once we can do, we can do the fun stuff when we got, or we can do maybe fasting isn't fun for you, but it's, it's a pretty big parasympathetic drop and it's nice to give your GI system a break. Um, it's all going to be contextual, right? I'm not going to do it with a 20 year old athlete. Um, but a guy who needs to lose 20, 30 pounds. Yeah. After a month of mastering the fundamentals, I'll play with it. If he doesn't like breakfast. Okay. Let's, let's I'm not going to be attached to that. I think it's all about adherence. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, now, it's, does that, that kind of answer it for sure. And I mean, you just gradually, you know, always like an exercise and uh, as you would see in nutrition, just kind of pushing people just beyond their capacity and, um, you know, those multiple snackers through the day. I mean, even just going from three to from six meals to three meals and fasting between breakfast and lunch is technically intermittent fasting for that baby steps, you know, and then you can sort of build from there, as you mentioned with intermittent fasting or full day fasting. Um, 
So yeah, that's that's great stuff. Now, if we look at some more of those loops that you mentioned in terms of you know sleep, is it uh, you know total sleep, quality sleep? Can you touch it on how that might impact testosterone levels and what we're seeing in the environment today? I think it definitely like so sleepy. If you have like five hours of sleep for five days, you can knock your testosterone down by like thirty percent, maybe even higher. Uh, so like the fastest way for people to get put on T- TRT is like overtrain and don't sleep. You can you can you can get it if you want it. Which pretty um, much describes everyone working in downtown Toronto right now. So this is good stuff here. <laughs> yeah, and and they're probably vitamin D deficient too. So we know that's going to drop it off um, too. So that there's a lot of things, the, tons of loops, right? Um, from a sleep standpoint, there's so many because you're gonna you're gonna drive up in, in inflammation, right? You're gonna be less sensitive to insulin or. And so, and those are all going to create a lot of other habits that are going to be detrimental to your testosterone, right? They're going to put on body fat and that's going to have aromatase in it and that's going to convert testosterone to estrogen. So it's, it's, it's about isolating someone's limiting factor. And it, honestly, if someone's airways are screwed up, I've seen this in a couple of, of pretty high level, like athletes, like a major league baseball player, um, you can, they have to get that fixed. Otherwise they're they're not going to get quality sleep and their testosterone and their glucose metabolism and insulin resistance is going to be jacked up right you bang on i mean we had that with one of our uh, kind of the basketball guys and you're dead right it's like if, if you're not getting that sleep then the, the trickle down effects are so significant and with this testosterone question i mean it's but like you said there are so many loops and it's almost like all these anchors that people have pulling their testosterone levels down versus what they tend to think of which we'll get into a bit later is this idea of wanting to just boost it up by taking external exogenous sources so um, any tips that you use on the sleep front like do you find are you shooting for a certain amount of time for your clients are you trying to help them build some sleep habits um does napping come into play can you can you touch on some of those yeah so i i, I love um, Dr. Kirk Parsley, obviously listened to him a lot. And so he's, he's the, he's the man in terms of sleep. And, Absolutely. Uh, and, and so for me, it's, it's kind of twofold. It's circadian rhythms, right? People got to see the sun. They got to see the sun ideally between the hours of 6am and 8am. The sun's probably got to hit their skin. So sleep is to me, it, you got, you have to earn your ability to sleep. Some people just have the ability to crash out but you want to move, right? If you haven't moved all day and you've eaten a ton of food, like why would your body want to sleep? And so, um, those are the big things. And then also blood glucose regulation is probably the first place we have to start with everyone, right? If your blood glucose is off, you're probably going to have trouble sleeping. Yeah. I mean, it's so true. Um, I remember traveling after university and being in Latin America, Costa Rica, spent a few months there and you know, it was like the sun came up and went down at the same time virtually all year round. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so all of a sudden you just start feeling fantastic. You're obviously getting up with the sun going down, not staying up too late after sunset. Uh, so it's amazing how that, yeah, that circadian rhythm piece uh, plays a massive, massive role. And, you know, up here in Toronto, like you said, people go from there in the wintertime. I mean, it's dark out until 7, 30, 8 o'clock. Yeah. People go from their warm house to their warm car to their warm office, and they never get exposed to any kind of outdoor light, which is a major, uh, major driver there. Um now, on the stress front, that's obviously another – can you walk us through how you know cortisol stress hormones can impact testosterone levels and some of the major stressors that you find in people's lives? Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback off that last comment, like even in, even in Toronto in the winter, like even if there's no sun, outside light is 10 times stronger than anything you're going to get inside, right? So don't think just because it's not sunny that you're not going to be able – that it's not going to be helpful. Um, so I think that's a common – like – disbelief or myth that people have that's a great point because we actually have all these tunnels in toronto i'm not sure if you're familiar about these tunnels underground that literally go for miles and miles so in the winter time you could you could just wear your your (laughs) jeans and a t-shirt and walk around the whole city underground and never see the sun so that's a really good point for for local listeners yeah for sure i'm from i'm from uh, a little bit north of chicago so i don't know that i could do another winter um what one of the reasons we moved here to costa rica is because my wife is actually like she's a night owl and um, and so I go to bed here. I'm because the sun's so strong. I'm, I have trouble staying up past eight 30 and then I can't sleep past about five 30. Yeah, um, that's fine. That's funny, man. I had the same experience when I was there. It's just like your body just gets dialed into this rhythm, right? Yeah. You don't even have a choice. And like, so she's, she would stay up to like 1am, 2am reading. And like, there's no way that I'm going to like, we've, we've been together for a really long time. And I'm like, and so we moved here and she's in bed, like she's sleeping by 10 PM, which is amazing to me. That is great. Environment rules all. Absolutely, man. 
Um, so yeah, getting back to the, the on the cortisol yeah. side of things, can you just walk the uh, listeners through? Uh, we got a lot of docs and trainers and nutritionists kind of listening in, so just kind of walk us through how that stress uh, impacts testosterone levels and then some of the low hanging fruit of, of, of major stressors and in, in, in clients. So cortisol, we we love to to hammer cortisol as kind of the bad guy. It's actually needed for uh for you you have to have it for a kind of a training response. You, if you so. It's a Goldilocks thing, and cortisol is going to inhibit testicular function at the level of the brain and at the level of the testicles. So that makes sense. If you're stressed, you're probably not going to want to secrete cortisol or secrete make testosterone, right? Um, and then the other thing we have to think about is all the other loops that cortisol starts to create. It's going to hinder digestion. It's going to lower SIGA or secretory IgA in the in the GI tract, which is going to potentially lead to some kind of infection, which is going to lead to inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction. So we have to get people parasympathetic. If they live in this sympathetic, dominant, autonomic dysregulation all the time, that we know they're going to be screwed up. That's not how, from an ancestral standpoint, that's not how we're wired. And so this um, is basically everyone who's living in a big city for the most part, or even any city that's kind of uh, getting up early, going to the gym, business meetings all day, family, friends, whatever, staying out late. I mean, this is a big, big part of the population that we're talking about, right? Yeah, I mean, it's huge. If, if you feel like your life is go, 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 you, you can just guarantee, I guarantee you, you're sympathetic, really just regulated. Because and the, the big thing for people listening in is that most clients, if you ask those that same person, you know, at least here in clinic in Toronto, if I ask those guys if they're stressed, the answer is always no, I'm fine. But like you said, when we look at all these parameters or if we run some labs, we just get all these huge warning signs on the dashboard of the car showing us that these stressors are definitely real. So it's a, it's a tough thing sometimes to put your f- finger on if you're that type A personality. Yeah, we had a we had a guy. Uh, we had some pretty high end clients in Texas, and one of them was the guy who built. Uh, he was in charge of all the cement for Jerry Jones's stadium down in Texas. Wow. And uh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's a great guy, great guy. And so we had the Omega Wave at the time, and like we, this guy's amazing, like super successful, really fun to be around. And we put him on the Omega Wave, and it was like seek medical help. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, that's that's uh, there you go, man. Sometimes you need that testing to really. Uh, for people to for people to realize it's time to make a change, and that guy was that guy was like, you ask him if he's stressed, he's like, no, nah, I have zero stress in my life. Like, what's your stress on a scale of one to ten? Ah, oh, like a three. <laughs> like, Definitely, no I mean, people have trouble connecting the dots, and I think sometimes you know, general docs are just uh, obviously crunch for time and looking for uh, pathologies. So sometimes a lot of this stuff will fly under their radar too. It shouldn't. Uh, it, that's that's a cop out on their point because stress is related to about like ninety percent of doctors' offices. So. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean it's if you want to start reducing the amount of visits and definitely addressing that, it's going to be a huge home run for all the docs listening in. Um, and yeah. yeah, but that's not what they want to do. Like that's that's Sachin talks about that a lot. It's like my goal is for people not to need me. I think that's your goal too. It's like I don't want to see you all the time. <laughs> exactly, like that whole deep prescribing and yeah, getting people in charge of their own health. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, any things that you and you know any whether interventions or, or, or tips or tricks that you give some of your clients on that stress front to just kind of the first line start to reduce that overall exposure or environmental? Yeah, when I talk to guys about this aspect, I usually I ask them about their day. Like, what does your day look like? And the majority of the time, it's it's basically for my clients, it's 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 working or in training. And then preparing for work or doing extra work, right? And so that to me is the problem. It's it's and I have to give these guys permission to do something that they love. Most of them have forgotten what it feels like not to work, um, not to be plugged in. And so it's it's really kind of that's it's hard to break, right? That can be really addictive. And so what do you like to do other than train and make money or work? And if they don't have an answer to that question, I don't think we're ever going to fix this stress response issue. That's so true. I mean, literally scheduling time to unplug is, is like a thing now we got to get people to do that. Cause otherwise you're, you're right. Busy people, type A's entrepreneurs, whatever you might call. It. I mean, they're just so go, go, go that it's uh yeah. If you don't have that time scheduled in or at least making time, put the phone away a day a week or, you know, these types of things and it's just, it's just uh it's never ending the uh the, all the all the different demands on time from work and everything else now if we shift gears to nutrient deficiencies can you talk about some of the key nutrients involved again i know it's broad spectrum here but some of the more key nutrients to think about when it comes to testosterone yeah of course um so 
one of the key things I think we need to think about with nutrients is like it's only going to help someone who's deficient. It's not going to – if you have really good zinc status, which we can't even measure. There's no good measurements for it. Um, you going super physiological and zinc is not going to raise your testosterone. So it's only going to help people who are low. But if your vitamin D is at 30 nanomoles per liter, you get up to 50, you'll probably get a little pop. Um, so vitamin D, magnesium, zinc, uh, vitamin B6, uh, boron has been related to it. Those, those are probably the big ones. Oh, vitamin A and vitamin D, which are obviously if someone's vitamin A and vitamin D are low, you're thinking what's going on with their life. Uh, and that could be the, the reason as well. So those, those are the big ones. And do you find any kind of patient populations, whether it's, uh, you know, the standard American diet, whether it's, um, you know, vegans, vegetarians, whether, you know, various types of athletes tend to fall into different categories and are patterns that you see there? Yeah. So I'm writing up a, a presentation right now all about vitamins and minerals. And, and I think it, it, we forget as I, I obviously I spent a, I grabbed thousands of dietary recalls at UT as part of my PhD, which I would rather have not done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like on 19 year olds, like, oh, you had easy Mac all day. Thanks. That's an um, easy one, right? There you go. <laughs> yeah. Three, you would like as a, as a worker, you're kind of like, oh, cool. You had Mac and cheese, jello pudding, and then you had a pop tart. Awesome. Huh. Uh, but as a human, you're like, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing so, we can still survive with just that as fuel, right? The human body's an amazing thing. The human body's so so cool. Um, the the amount of shit that it can put up with is is just amazing um, to me, and it, it's it's kind of unfortunate too because it's probably why we're in a lot of the problems that we're in because um, symptoms are lagging. <laughs> and so, from a dietary standpoint, I'm I'm always I think we lose track. Like, what is the best dietary analysis tool? It's what people eat. It's not, it's like, what are you intaking? Um, you don't need to run any micronutrient tests if someone eats, you know, it has a horrible diet. It's kind of like running a cortisol test if someone's running with their, like running with like a chicken with their head cut off. It's not going to be helpful. You're just watching chaos. Um, so for me, for me, it's, it's really like if someone's vegan, they're not going to, they're not going to have B vitamins. They're screwed. Like they're not going to be able to run their methylation pathways. They're not going to be able to get run of they, – they can't get rid of estrogen, right? So the, every diet is going to have its holes. Um, if you do paleo the wrong way and you just pound protein, you're going to be micronutrient deficient. We see, I've seen that a ton, right? My, my paleo diet is ribeyes and chicken thighs all day long um, and I don't eat any vegetables and fiber. So it, every diet has, has its positives and negatives and, and I think you have to eat real food, mostly plants is, is something that all of us need to do. Definitely. I mean, that, obviously that individualized approach is so key and it sounds like a, that's a big part of uh, your practice, but it's, it's tough for people, isn't it? To just uh, think of everything as a tool. We sort of get into this love affair of it almost becomes like politics or religion where people get really, really devoted to the nutritional approach that they're taking versus just, you know, stepping back, looking, doing like a gaps and needs analysis and saying, Hey, this is what I need more of and putting more of that in. Yeah. I think, I think we see that because of the complexity of the field and also the newness of the field. Um, nutritional science is, is relatively, it's very new. Um, we've only been studying this stuff for maybe 50, 80, maybe a hundred years. Right. It, and so there's no way. And whenever humans encounter complex topics, we, we want to make them simple. And so to me, whenever I talk to someone like yourself or people who are really like really, really getting in the trenches and, and looking at the research, we definitely agree way, way more than we disagree. Um, and, and so that's what if you talk to someone that maybe doesn't understand that complexity, they're going to be way more apt to make rash generalizations and kind of think in that black and white viewpoint. Absolutely. Um, last one here before we shift over to what I see a lot in terms of the medicated clients coming in is the impact on thyroid. Can you touch on that? The thyroid testosterone connection? Yeah. So thyroid turns on every cell in the human body. If you, if you don't have thyroid, everything's going to turn down, right? It's our gas pedal. Um, and, and unfortunately in the, in the conventional model, nobody's running like full thyroid panels on males and males don't male. The one of the, I think the, the heart of this issue is males, between the ages of 18 and 44, they go to the doctor 53% less than females. So ma- males just don't think that anyone, they don't ask for help. And why would they, right? If they go to the conventional doc, he's not going to maybe give them a statin or something, right? And so what we have to do is we have to change the paradigm. We have to say, okay, it's okay for you to ask for help. 
and and come into the office and and let's talk about it. I'm not gonna rip you apart, right? And let's just make you feel better because most guys will just they'll they'll just grin and bear it. Absolutely. I heard a great quote where apparently men only go to the doctor for two reasons. And the first one is if it starts to their health, poor health starts to interfere with their work life. And the second one is if their poor health starts to interfere with their sex life. Beyond that, <laughs> they're just going to grin and bear it until hell or high water. So great, uh, great comment there. Now, you touched on statins, which we know reduce uh, testosterone levels. Now, I often see in my clinic, guys will have already gone to their GP. They've run a, a testosterone test and just like you said if they're run down and feeling like crap then it's obvious that they'll be low testosterone they get put on a testosterone cream or gel um they feel like a champion for four weeks maybe eight weeks and then by 12 weeks they are flatlining they are now worse than where they started with um can you touch on what's going on there and uh you know if you see see a little bit of that with some of the people that you work with as well yeah i'm not sure if this is the it, like scientifically the best analogy but i think people can get it um, so think of testosterone as your horsepower, right? And so if I just have a guy whose car is completely shit, right? His brakes are gone, axles are trash, right? If I put more horsepower in his engine, this is not a good idea. Um, and, and so I would also, I would never like, uh, Jay Campbell has a really good book. It's, it's pretty alpha, but, um, I think creams and gels are just a horrible decision. Like why would you put testosterone through subcutaneous adipose tissue? That's just like a recipe for disaster for me. Um, if you're going to use TRT, like use the real thing. Um, don't mess around. And can you walk people through? Yeah. What happens? I mean, I see this all the time in terms of estrogen levels ramping up, but what happens when you, for guys who already have these pathways that are upregulated with aromatization, what happens when they start pouring more testosterone into the system? You get rid of testosterone through estrogen. So if you don't have methyl <laughs> groups and your GI function is done, like you're done. Like you're going to get super estrogen dominant and, and, it's not going to be helpful. Like your testosterone is not, it may not even go up. You might just push estrogen up. And so if you don't, that's the key, like the journal of clinical endocrinology, you have to address lifestyle issues before you start any of this stuff. That's fantastic. Ben. I, I, I tell us all the time to my clients, but it's great to have uh, great to have the expert voice here as well to, uh, to double up on that. For sure. Um, terrific. Now, any, now if we get into start getting into some, uh, some solutions here like it what uh what type of lab testing do you run if you run any um or what clientele would you start to to get to look under the hood and see what's going on and then we'll get into some uh, diet exercise lifestyle solutions yeah so i think like if i have a when or if i have a son right i will get i will start getting testosterone measurements on him annually as soon as i can right so um obviously and not to go down a super loop but he's not going to touch any pesticides when he's a kid um and that, so what we want to do is we want to start testing early so we can get some baseline level of what people are, where people are at. And if you don't have that, just go get a test. It's a testosterone draw. I think it itself in the United States is like $13 plus a $15 draw fee. It's not expensive. Um, you also want to get sex hormone binding globulin. You probably, you can get up there kind of quick, but you can get a really good panel for $150 to $175. Um, and just get a get a kind of lay of the land and, and start to – you have to get data um, and that's really, really important so that you can track it as you go, right? And data is not the end-all, be-all. Um, you are not your lab work. But we, we do need objective measures. Does that kind of answer your question? For sure, yeah. I think it's great. Like you mentioned, it's a snapshot in time, but it starts to set up this baseline for people and having measures of – you know, total panels, like you mentioned, of like free testosterone or total testosterone, bioavailable testosterone, and some of the other hormones that we can spill over into, like the sex hormone binding globulin, the SHBG, estradiols, DHEAs, DHTs. It's, you know, it's nice to be able to get a, a full picture of what's going on because when you can start to appreciate for where some of those leaks are. Yeah, if I order a comprehensive, I'll usually go urine um, in blood because blood gets pretty expensive when you start ordering all those metabolites. Um, it gets, in, at least in the United States, it gets real expensive real fast. You start throwing, you know, ultra sensitive estradiol is about like 60 bucks itself. Um, but I'll, I'll definitely grab, and the other thing with athletes, so many of them are dehydrated. So you'll push that albumin level up and as if SHBG is high, your free testosterone could be tanked just from that. Um, and so that's something that free, that free testosterone level is probably debatable. I'd be more apt to use a calculator there just to save yeah. money. I, don't, sure. I could be wrong. For sure. And do you find yourself using a mix of like blood, urine tests, salivary tests, or depending on the different clients that you work with? I don't use salivary at all. It's, it's to me, it's, it's, um, it's, there's too much day-to-day -day variation. 
Um, that's just my personal opinion, especially from, from a cortisol the rhythm standpoint. It is less invasive, but it's not standardized. And so for me, I, I go with blood work first. And then if if they still have symptomatology or something like that, maybe I'll run like a precision analytics dried urine test. Or, but it's, it's honestly, it's somewhat rare that I would run that. Um, usually we can get it figured out with, with just blood labs, but I'll run it if, especially if someone's financially, I try to keep things as cost effective as possible because that's one of my biggest, uh, things that I think the functional medicine world needs to work on is like, Hey, maybe someone doesn't need $1,700 in testing before they walk in your office. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I think, you know, like you mentioned, if a lab test isn't going to steer your course or your intervention in a different direction, then you're just, uh, getting a test done to reconfirm what you already know through the symptoms and everything else. So that's a, that's a great point. So now yeah, it's kind of like IGF. Like I was, I was on, I was talking to a guy the other day and he wanted to measure his IGF levels. And I'm like, what are you going to do if it's low? Like, tell me <laughs> <laughs> you're going you're gonna to sleep and maybe take some arginine. Cool. Why you can, arginine's debatable, but do that anyways. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. So let's get into some solutions then for people. So diet, exercise, lifestyle, what are some of the big rocks for you in terms of dietary interventions? If we just start with, um, you know, an overweight client, uh, abdominal adiposity, what, what are some areas that we can uh, start to get some, some movement? Well, if, some, if someone's overweight, the first thing we have to do is they, they have to lose weight. Um, because that, that adipose tissue is, is basically an estrogen factory. Um, and so guys, we're, we're meant to be lean. We should, I mean, what is lean? It's probably somewhere around, I don't know, it's debatable, but if you're from a colder climate, maybe you want to be around 12%. If you're from somewhere equatorial, maybe less. Um, but I think that's, that's stage one is we gotta, we gotta induce weight loss. So we're going to need some kind of overall negative caloric balance. And we want to stay, my big threshold is like 15%. I, I don't want to lose a weight super fast in men because if we know if we drop calories by more than 15 percent we're going to lose thyroid function we're going to lose testosterone it might be counterproductive itself um so i'm that's that's kind of my first thing if it would be if it's kind of your prototypical maybe someone who's 30 pounds overweight and they they're just stressed out of their mind Awesome. Awesome. And what about if, if we, if we shift gears now, we see, you know, obviously athletes training really hard, lean fit, but when we're, you know, we see low T levels. So what are some of your strategies there? Um, if you can't change necessarily, you know, training volume, it's in season, that kind of thing. Yeah. Sleep is going to be our biggest thing there. Like that's pretty, that's like, that's out of Stanford. So the number one thing we can do in that situation is just have someone sleep more. Like how much sleep can you get? Um, and that, that would be the first thing because it's probably the easiest, like unhook them from their cell phone. If it's a professional athlete and be like, Hey dude, you got to rest. I stopped texting chicks at, you know, 2 a.m. There you go. Uh, and so that's, that's square one. And then, then it's probably fueling them effectively would be square two for me is, is, is just making sure that they're getting the calories they need um, to fuel their activity, right? Cause you've worked in the professional sports arena, like basketball is, dude, they practice for like four hours a day. They get still got a lift and then they're shooting around for like hours. So, and then they're, they're already six, eight, 240, 260. So like the amount of calories that these guys need is insane. Absolutely. I mean, it's a huge one is just getting enough fuel in the tank. Now in terms of fats and stuff, do you prioritize any types of fats in terms of saturated, monounsaturated or the things that you like to throw in there to support? Yeah, we're gonna see we're gonna see like testosterone dysregulation whenever you drop below like 0.4 to 3.3 to 0.4 grams per kilogram. So I'm never gonna go below that. And both most of these guys are they need so much food and like if they're if you're eating 4,000 calories, like you're gonna eat a lot of fat because you can only get so much protein. You can only you can only take so many carbs. So um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, it's kind of I think we're gonna get really far along the genetics where we can kind of tell people like, hey, you want to stay more towards polyunsaturated or hey, saturated or probably not a problem for you. I think in the next five to ten years we're gonna get there. Um, we're not there yet, but um, I think we will get there. Awesome. Now, if we shift gears towards the training side of things, again, we'll use the same kind of overweight clients and, and the athletes. So for on the exercise side of things for that overweight guy trying to trim that belly fat, get the T levels up, uh, you know, compound movements, what are your, uh, what are your tips there? Yeah. So for weight loss, I think we can get really, really lost in like the exercise stimulus. 
But as far as weight loss, it's very minimal. Like we have to get baseline movement. You have to have meat. Um, cause if you, if you're not, if you don't get more than 7,000 steps a day, your, your entire appetite is dysregulated. Um, and so if you have a sedentary job, that's, that's what we have to start with first. Cause stacking a bunch of high intensity intervals on, it might be better than never doing anything, but it's, it's not better if you don't have that baseline movement. Um, does that make sense? Is that- Absolutely. I mean, it, you know, I just had Keith Norris on there, um, founder of the paleo FX and he's, you know, his big three is obviously lift heavy stuff. Um, continual movement and then sprinkling in some more high intensity stuff once they have that foundation. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's bang on uh, for athletes. Any, any tips there? I mean, I know volume is always such a big thing. You talked about the mega wave already or areas to, to assess that, but, um, you know, any, any training tips if, if you are seeing kind of that, um, l- poor recovery, low T, uh, picture pr- coming up. Yeah, as, as you know, like as a strength in the strength coach world, like the amount of control you have on your overall athlete's volume is somewhat minimal, um, especially if they're in the collegiate or professional setting. Like the coach is going to drive the ship, um, and so I think you have to do everything in your power to do do what you can to master the fundamentals outside, so that it's not an overtraining. They might be in like an overtraining situation, but you don't want them to be in an under under recovery situation. Um, and so that, that turns into all of a sudden you're managing everything, nutrition, sleep, stress reduction. Like I'd probably use heart math in that situation. Cause, um, that's going to be maybe your biggest bang for the buck. Maybe even something like the Blackhawks have new calm, which is, which I might buy here in a little bit, which it's a huge parasympathetic drop, like Byron will beats. You're sucking on some kind of supplement. I don't know. I got to talk to the guy, but, awesome. uh, yeah, it's it's really cool, um, and they've had they've had really great results with it, and so like every maybe float tanks like I'd, I'd go into that if if money's kind of not of an it's not an issue, that's what I would that's what I would do I'd maybe get a little biohacky with it. Absolutely, I mean I think yeah, just in today's environment, and like you said, these guys are just uh, whether they're training hard all the time and then their downtime, we just have the stimulus from phones and blue light and everything else, so it's almost like the nervous system doesn't have a chance to just shut off and you know get out to the wilderness in Costa Rica and the pitch black and just uh, decompress would be a, would be part would be an on top order. I think. Yeah. One of my, one of my buddies, he's, his name's coach Estes and he was the, he was the, one of the directors of sports performance for the university of Maryland. And he, they had the Omega wave and they were, they were doing some really cool stuff with Zephyr and everything. And, and what he found is that some, it's not all about like what you think is going to cause a parasympathetic drop. Like you could tell somebody to meditate and it could be like the scariest moment of their life. Um, so you have to figure out individually what is going to help this person relax. And for some dudes, it could be just like, Hey, I want you to stare at the bookshelf for five minutes. Um, and, and so, and then heart math is probably the easiest way I've found because there's no choice. You're just breathing with a pacer and that's the fastest way to switch autonomics. But there's so many other things that we have at our disposal. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the breath is a really quick tool to get in to that state. And then absolutely, I mean, the things that uh, new new practices, new stimuluses are often stressful for people. So it's ironic that, yeah, you, you prescribe somebody meditation and all of a sudden they're uh, more stressed than they've ever been. So that kind of dovetails into this lifestyle question. Are there, you know, we sort of touched on sleep and stress, but in that sort of lifestyle environment realm, are there, are there things that you, uh, interventions, tips that you would like to, that you implement with your clients? Yeah, I think being mindful is the end all be all right if someone's mindful of their life if they're mindful of their relationships if they're mindful of their environment if they're mindful of what they eat all of a sudden they stop beating themselves up and they start making decisions so better decisions so for me that's we have to start some kind of mindfulness based practice and the research is pretty clear you want to start that guided so it could be headspace bootify whatever app you want to use just find somebody you vibe with and then do that be consistent get humans are amazing like they they don't really respond well to to carrots but they don't like losing things so what i'll try to do is i'll have somebody start a streak like hey get 30 days under your belt we got to get 30 days and then i'll be like dude get 100 and so you get that alpha guy and he's he's not going to want to lose that streak and so sit for 15 minutes try to make it 100 days and then try to make it a thousand awesome awesome great great advice man now, if we uh, if we talk about supplements here, if we shift gears again to uh, you know, there's su- such a huge industry built around obviously low T and supplements. Can you uh, walk us through the literature and and what might be interesting and perhaps some of the ones that are just uh, absolute no gos that are perhaps popular at the moment? 
Yeah, I think we got to be really, really careful, especially if you're messing with uh, professional athletes or people who are drug tested, because that's the most common way, maybe not necessarily people going for T-boosters, but that's the most common way athletes get popped is unknowingly. Like there's DHEA in their protein powder and they have no idea. Um, and the supplement industry is just, it's, un, it's completely unregulated. And so to me, if something worked, it would be illegal. <laughs> that's pretty... Um, the, Absolutely. The, the Olympic Committee is pretty good about finding out what works. And and, uh, and so, yeah, like you can't take Andro, you can't take DHEA. And, and those are sprinkled in, a, you know, a lot of supplement products if they're if they don't have third party testing. Um, you can, I mean, maybe Tribulus if someone but that's an LH mechanism. So if their LH is down, maybe that would work. Um, that's that luteinizing hormone that gets driven down by, you know, stress and things like that. Correct. Yeah, that's the that's it comes off the pituitary. So the hypothalamus produces GnRH and, and primarily in the at nighttime, and then GnRH stokes LH, and then all those hormones are pulsatile, which was which is another problem with TRT, right? So we have this we, testosterone is a circadian rhythm hormone. It's a seasonal hormone, right? Our our testosterone goes up in the late summer um, when we would have had a lot of carbohydrate availability, um, and we're probably more apt to make babies, um, and so. But when we put on some somebody on TRT, which is it, which is needed, right? If someone's been knocked in the testicles or had a TBI or or they just have a variceal or something like that, um, they might need TRT and it might be very very helpful. And the research is actually pretty solid. But for everybody else, we don't want to just have this giant tuba player of a of a testosterone going all the time, right? And that's not very natural. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, any any other supplements for the average guy again, whether it's amino acids or other herbals that uh, might be worth uh, checking out? I and find I, like most guys, most guys who want to take those supplements, I'm like, hey, what do you eat, man? And they're like, ah, oh, these diets are horrible. Like I have McDonald's and stuff. I'm like, so I think that's we got to go food first. Um, none of this, none of, the, none of the nonsense is gonna work. And and we know sub even like mineral, vitamins and minerals, like they aren't even gonna work if you stack them on a shitty diet. Um, and it's, that's because there's so much we don't know, right? There's 8,000 phytochemicals that we don't have even have a name for. Um, so we got we got to eat good food. 100 percent, man. Couldn't agree more. And I think it's great to, to reinforce that message because it, you know, it's become so popular now in this sort of quote unquote low T um, epidemic of just reaching for medications, pills, powders, supplements. When at the end of the day, just like you mentioned, you know, diet, exercise, these lifestyle factors. You just heard Dr. Ben mention sleep is one of the ultimate. Um, you got to just prioritize, make time for those things because they're going to be the biggest hammers to really get that those T levels back. Now, Ben, the question everyone wants to know is, uh, tell us about your morning routine. But we talk a lot about coffee on the show. We want to we want to know, uh, you know, are you a coffee drinker? Well, if so, uh, how do you how do you start your morning? Yeah, so I wake up and I wake up without an alarm clock. I've done I've. I made the decision like three years ago, I think I was like, I'm not taking, cause I was a personal trainer for, since I was 19. Um, and I was like, I'm not taking any more clients in the morning. Um, and so I, for the last, that was probably the biggest driver for me. I, I was completely like, if anybody's screwed up, like I'm the poster child for like, I was 24 and I would drive to UT and like sleep in a Prius for like four hours, dude. I was, I was as screwed up as it was. <laughs> nice. Uh, and, and so for me, it's, I wake up without an alarm clock. I immediately go sit for 15 minutes. Cause if I don't do it, then, then I'm not, I'm probably, it may not happen. Uh, and then I usually depending on if it's a training day or not, I'll usually, the morning's my most productive hours. Uh, the wifey's still asleep. The dogs are still asleep. And so I'll, I'll bang out a good two hours on, uh, writing and PubMed and then I'll have breakfast and I'll usually, I'll have, I'll start the day with, I'm a big, from a, like my goal is obviously hypertrophy and I'll kind of, I'll, I won't really switch that up that often, but, um, it's strength and strength and power and, and hypertrophy. And so I'll eat five boluses of food the majority of the time with about 40 grams of protein. Um, and so I'll start the morning with collagen protein. Uh, I use pure paleo and I'll do that in, uh, two thirds decaf and one third caffeinated coffee. Um, Nice. How much caffeine do you think you're getting? Is how how big's that uh, mug? Uh yeah. So I, it's only I use a French press, and so okay, it's cool. only one. I only use one tablespoon of caffeinated coffee. So I might guess it would be maybe 40, 50 milligrams. Um, and so, so not the six hundred that uh, a lot of my clients are starting their day with with the ventis right first thing in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean. <laughs> 
the the research on caffeine is is so crazy to me. Like people people think that they if they drink some coffee it's gonna help them in the gym, right? It may like take off the edge of your tiredness, but like to get a performance increase from ta- caffeine, you have to take like four milligrams per kilogram. Like it's insane. Like I would have to take like six hundred, eight hundred thousand milligrams to get a four percent performance pop. Um, so you probably don't want to play that game all the time. And so for me, coffee is a ritual and we've had so many rituals as humans. We used to be, think of how many rituals we had. We had tons of them and now we have zero. Um, and so coffee is, it's just a ritual for people. There's a smell, they love doing it. And, and so I, I find it hard to take that away. Yeah, man. Just like you mentioned, it's almost meditation with like quiet time in the morning. People go through the same rhythm of the same activity there. Um, Awesome, Ben. This is great stuff. Really appreciate you making the time. Um, where can people get in touch with you or keep up to date with what you're doing in terms of your writings and your work? Yeah, so I, I, I may, I'm trying to change this. My, I post a ton on Facebook, I'm trying to take more time away from that, actually. And I'll probably take one week off a month. But I post probably five to six days, something research-related. Um, I spend four hours a day writing and researching. It's kind of, it's what I love to do. Um, and then I'll take clients in the afternoon and you, so Facebook, uh, Instagram is more just like nonsense. Um, and then, uh, functional medicine Costa Rica is where the longer forms will go out. And then 